The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Your diagnosis does not define you. That kind of message helped put mental health issues into better perspective for everyone. But tonight, we'll learn why there is concern out there that young people may have now become too eager to seek out once feared mental health labels. Then, author Daniel Pink explains why facing regrets head-on can be a powerful way to look forward. It's Wednesday, June 29th, and that's next on The Agenda. It's finally okay to talk about mental health issues far more broadly than before. But as the stigma around mental health issues has receded thanks to years of concerted effort, some experts are now concerned about a different potential problem, the eagerness of some particularly young people to get a diagnosis. Is this a good problem to have or just a problem? Let's ask, in Geneva, Switzerland, Dr. Quam McKenzie, CEO of the Wellesley Institute and a psychiatrist at CAMH, the Center for Addiction and Mental Health. In San Diego, California, Jean Twangy, professor of psychology at San Diego State University and the author of iGen, why today's super-connected kids are growing up less rebellious, more tolerant, less happy, and completely unprepared for adulthood. In Vancouver, British Columbia, Dr. Thomas Unger, staff psychiatrist at St. Michael's Hospital and a professor of psychiatry at the University of Toronto. And here in our studio, Dr. Ralph Lewis, child and youth psychiatrist at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Centre and an assistant professor of psychiatry also at U of T. And we're grateful to all of you for joining us here on TVO tonight. Uh, Ralph Lewis, going to start with you because it was your piece in Psychology Today that got us thinking about this topic. So I'm going to read an excerpt of that and then we're off to the races. Sheldon, if you would. Something strange has been happening, you write, in the psychiatric clinic in the last few years. Large numbers of people, particularly teens and young adults, have been seeking psychiatric assessments, certain that they are suffering from a mental illness and quite insistent on obtaining a diagnosis for anxiety, major depression, ADHD, autism spectrum disorder, PTSD. Not that their life stresses aren't challenging and their distress real, but their difficulties typically fall short of the criteria for diagnosis and seem within the range of normal. What's going on? How did we go from the destigmatization to the desirability of psychiatric diagnoses almost overnight? All right, let's dive a little deeper down on that one. Your experiences in the clinic that led you to believe that this was the case. Give us an example. Thank you, Steve. Steve, I've been a psychiatrist for 26 years, treating uh, youth and young adults. <clears throat> I very much enjoy working with this population. I, I love this population. Uh, my kids are in this generation. Uh, when I started out, kids used to be dragged in, you might say, by their parents, uh, embarrassed, mortified to be seeing a psychiatrist and uh, generally quite resistant to uh, any suggestion that they may be suffering from a, a mental disorder, with exceptions. Not all kids were like that, of course. But these days, uh, interestingly, the kids themselves are very often requesting consultations with a psychiatrist. Uh, in fact, uh, insisting or demanding that their parents and, uh, and primary doctors send them to a psychiatrist. Now, let me be clear, some for very good reason, and I'm so glad that they feel comfortable doing so, and uh, they're definitely coming to the right place. But increasingly, there's a larger and larger proportion of kids, uh, my colleagues and I have noticed, who are presenting with, you might say, mild to moderate uh, distress and stress. Uh, they may or may not meet criteria for something like a depressive disorder or an anxiety disorder or another mental disorder, but the threshold for seeking help has lowered. And so uh, an example might be, uh, let's say, and, and let me be clear, whenever I give examples, uh, I'm uh, creating 
a composite example in my mind mm. to protect individuals' uh, confidentiality. Uh, so let's say there's a 17-year-old uh, grade 12 uh, young woman who uh, uh, comes to my office and tells me she thinks that she has suffered from major depression uh, f for many years and yet, uh, objectively, uh, is, is not doing too badly. Is doing uh, quite well academically, has a good circle of friends. Uh, according to her parents, uh, uh, frequently enjoys uh, social activities, is enthusiastic about, uh, about various extracurricular activities and, and yet, sports. And yet wants a diagnosis that something is wrong. And is, uh, is disappointed. Uh, <laughs> Crestfallen sometimes, you know, when I offer a reassuring statement, an encouraging statement, saying that no, uh, I don't think that this is a mental disorder. And of, of course, uh, you know, I try to empathize and say, yes, uh, you know, life is stressful, you're having a, a difficult time, but this isn't necessarily a uh, psychiatric disorder, and I don't think medication is what you need. All right, that's the thesis. Let's get to your colleagues now. We'll find out some feedback from them on what you have discovered. Um, okay, Jean Twenge, get us, uh, get us continuing on this path here. Is this something that you see in your practice as well? Well, to be clear, I'm not a clinical psychologist or a psychiatrist, so my expertise is in looking at generational trends, um, in particular, generational trends in mental health, say among teens and young adults, the population that we're discussing here. So what's interesting is that I would agree that there has certainly been um, more destigmatization of mental health issues, that young people are talking about them in person and online quite a bit more than they used to, and it's become much more acceptable. However, there's a separate trend that rates of depression in this population have skyrocketed. They doubled in just an eight year period. And we know that from data from the US, from the UK, Canada, pretty much all the English speaking countries, we see this increase in depression. And that's in screening studies of the whole population where it doesn't matter if you sought treatment or sought help or admitted to something online, these are anonymous surveys. But it's not just admitting to symptoms. We see the same trends in behaviors. So emergency room admissions for self-harm, like cutting or taking too many pills, have doubled or tripled in this population, including among very young populations, 10 to 14-year-old girls is where we see the biggest increase. And most tragic of all, we also see really big increases in this population in the suicide rate. So given that this shows up in behaviors, this is a real trend. So we know it's not just due to help seeking or wanting treatment. So I think maybe the causation goes the other way, that we have a true increase in mental health issues, at least in terms of anxiety and depression. And then that leads to a lot more discussion. And in this population, yes, there may be some influence there of almost like everybody's doing it. We have so many more people with um, anxiety and depression, and that may lead people who don't actually meet criteria for these disorders to start thinking maybe they have them and showing up at psychiatrists' offices or doctor's offices. So I, th I, I basically have some areas of agreement and some areas of uh, disagreement here. Okay, understood. And and thank you for clarifying off the top. I guess I shouldn't have used the word of practice. I should have said in your world at San Diego State University. So thanks for clarifying that. Uh, Quam McKenzie, come on in here and tell us uh, your view on what you've heard so far. They're very, very interesting. And uh, I did just want to say two things. Uh, I know it's not the intention of anyone here, but I wanted to ensure that no one's put up by the discussion and people continue to come forward uh, with their mental health problems. It takes a lot of courage to come forward and say you have a mental health problem. And I wanted to ensure assure that, Pete, that there is effective treatment available. So I wanted to say that. I also wanted to say that some people will be watching this show and they'll say, I really don't know what's going on, uh, because they'll say in their world, 
The problem is that people are suffering because they can't get help. And whether or not overdiagnosis is an issue, the overwhelming health issue that we have is that we underfund mental health services and most people complain that they can't get access to care and there are long wait times to see anyone. And if you're outside Toronto, in remote and, or rural areas, simply the problem is you can't get care. And if you're a racialized group or an indigenous group, the lack of access to culturally appropriate treatment and concerns that treatment will be discriminatory is really a problem. So I think it's important to say, yes, I think we should find out what's going on and work out what's going on in some of these Toronto hospitals. But we shouldn't forget the bigger picture here. Quam, I'm going to do a fast follow-up with you because if I'm reading between the lines here, it's almost as if you are concerned that uh, maybe the Minister for Mental Health Issues, uh, federally or provincially, might be watching this program, seize upon it and say, aha, see, we don't need to put as much money into this as these doctors all claim we do. Is that a concern you have? I think that there is a concern that uh, sometimes well-meaning uh, narratives uh, can be hijacked by other people. Uh, but I, it's two things. One, that um, people might say, OK, well, perhaps we don't need more health uh, spending. But it's also the other uh, possibility that uh, people will say, well, I don't know whether I'm going to go forward and ask for help. I don't know whether I'm going to go forward and ask to see if I have a diagnosis. Uh, because maybe the psychiatrist will just uh, say that I haven't got a problem. And so I, I, I just wanted to reassure people uh, that there's effective treatment available and uh, coming forward and uh, disclosing your mental health issues and having that discussion is a really important thing to do. Gotcha. And thanks for putting that on the record. Thomas Unger, your view. Yeah, so I totally agree. It's great that we've destigmatized some of the mental illnesses and the language, and, and people are coming forward, and I encourage people to still do that. We have seen a significant increase, particularly in youth in emergency rooms. Um, that's very real, and in the, in the rates of the disorders. But just to speak to the overdiagnosis, I, I don't know if it's overdiagnosis, but we've contributed to this in our field because the name we use for these disorders are also the same words we use for normal feelings. My hockey team loses, I'm depressed, time to get help. And you don't want to take away that, that sadness or suffering. So really, we have not really done a very good job differentiating the demarcation point between normal symptoms, normal emotions, and when we think it's a cause for concern. Uh, we've labeled these disorders with these names, and every area in medicine goes through this. First, you realize there's some kind of a health problem and mental illness is not mental health. We don't even want to use the word mental illness. Everything's now mental health. It's like physical health versus physical illness. So um, every, every field in medicine goes through this. We cluster symptoms together. We call it a syndrome. We give it a name. And then later we figure out what's going on. Is there junk in your lung? Is there high sugar in your blood? And then we figure out the cause. So in psychiatric disorders, mental illness disorders, mental health, we're at the stage where we cluster these syndromes, we're getting the correlated physiologic things going on with it, but we're kind of stuck there. But really, perhaps our wonderful words that we want to temper everything to make them politically acceptable and bring people forward, which we want to do, like mental health rather than mental illness, is having the side effect of creating everyone thinking that their experience and youth with that time of emotional turmoil, suddenly needing help and having a diagnosis, which may get them uh, a lot of attention, a lot of support, maybe even some accommodation. So it's a good side effect of this problem that we're encouraging people to come forward and talk about uh, these issues. Ralph Lewis, let me see if we can better understand what's in it for the young people to come forward and get a diagnosis for whatever it is they're feeling. What's in it for them? <laughs> Well, first, Steve, let, let me just say that I'm so glad that Jean and Kwan made the points they did about not wanting to discourage people uh, from coming forward if they think they have a mental health problem. Uh, Destigmatization uh, uh, is far from complete. And that, that would be the last thing I would want, is to give the message uh, of discouraging people from seeking help. I think Tom uh, articulated the problem uh, very well, the, uh, the demarcation problem. But let me speak to your point, right? What's in it? Uh, 
So you know, life is stressful uh, for young people. Uh, without a doubt, it's been very stressful during the pandemic. But to be clear, the trends that we're talking about go back probably approximately two decades. And so uh, the points I was making were mo mostly pertaining to pre-pandemic. Uh, the um, Life was was arguably uh, more stressful for young people than ever before. Um, people may dispute that. A diagnosis offers validation, uh, and it offers an explanation uh, for why uh, people are having the difficulties uh, that they're having, why they're struggling, why they're, uh, they feel that they're functioning suboptimally. Uh, but I think it's a very complex cultural phenomenon. Uh, I think that uh, there, uh, there, there may be an, an element for some kids uh, of um, unhealthily becoming a little too attached to the identity of someone who is, is uh, impaired and sick and disabled. Um, again, that's only a subset of kids, but it's a, it's a noticeable trend. Um, I, I, I've heard kids uh, say to me that uh, they feel like uh, in their peer culture, uh, they need some sort of official, as they put, often put it, explanation for uh, why they are stressed and distressed. Well, having said that, and uh, okay, Gene Twangy, let me get you in on this. If you're in your 20s today, you have firsthand memories of 9-11, of the Great Recession, of living through COVID and Donald Trump, and now there's a war, uh, so if you've got some Eastern European lineage, there's a war going on in Russia or Ukraine, which may be taking an impact out on your parents or grandparents. You've got plenty of reasons nowadays to feel miserable, do you not? Well, so did the people who lived through the Great Depression and those who lived through World War II and the uh, baby boomers in the U.S. who were drafted to fight in Vietnam and the Gen Xers who lived through the time of extremely high violent crime in the early 90s. So every generation has one thing or another going on in the world that is stressful. What's curious about this increase in depression and self-harm and suicide in the last decade is Violent crime, until very recently, has been much lower than it was in the 90s. Um, in, unless, as you pointed out, you have relatives in Eastern Europe, it's peacetime. Uh, the period from, say, 2011 to 2019, when we saw the largest increase in mental health issues, the economy around the world was doing very well. So it's a real mystery to say, why did we see this increase starting in 2011 or 2012? When I first started to see these trends, I had absolutely no idea what could be causing them because if anything, they were misaligned with the state of, of things in the world. But it may not be a coincidence because the early 2010s is when smartphones became predominant and when social media use among teens and young adults moved from optional to mandatory. In a very short period of time, you went from, well, some people are using these technologies, to almost everyone is, and young people started to sleep less, and they started to spend less time with other people face to face. And that is not a good formula for mental health, particularly when it comes to anxiety and depression. So the pressures of technology, which young people and all, you know, all of us live with every day and it affects people's everyday lives, I think is the most likely explanation because a lot of these other events, most of them with the exception of the pandemic, didn't have much of an impact on people's day-to-day -day lives. But the way young people spend their time outside of school and work is completely different now than it was 10 or 15 years ago. And I think that has clearly had a big impact on their mental health. Okay, let's pursue that angle, uh, Quam McKenzie, because, uh, you know, Gene Twenge is absolutely right. It's not as if previous generations didn't have their issues from Spanish flu to World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, and on and on it goes. So do you want to lay this at the foot of social media as a potential explanation 
uh, for why this particular generation seems to be having so many more difficulties, and certainly thinks it does, than previous generations? Well, I think there's a lot of things going on. Uh, I mean, let's just get back to basics. When society um, and mental health systems are working properly, the majority of people with mental health problems are successfully dealt with by individuals, their family, friends, and communities. For a minority where that's not enough, uh, they are seen by family doctors, and for a minority where that's not enough, uh, then they're seen by mental health specialists. So there are usually loads of different levels that you need to go through before you end up uh, getting a diagnosis from a psychiatrist. The problem is that things aren't working properly uh, communities are uh, more siloed. Social cohesion is going down. Uh, there's less connect connectivity, and uh, actually, um, in the UK, they ended up they've ended up having a minister for loneliness because so many people are lonely. So communities have decreased abilities to support and treat people who are distressed. So more people go to family doctors. But during the pandemic, say, for instance, the availability of appointments has been limited. So more people go to the emergency departments uh, and then more people are seen by psychiatrists. But the problem isn't necessarily uh, people. Uh, the problem is that we uh, need to beef up our community and primary care supports for mental illness. And if we do that, then people will get the appropriate support in the community than they need, rather than being referred to people who may prescribe. So I think there is something about um, uh, changes, not only in society, but also in the way society is responding uh, to social stress and, uh, and, and anxiety, which is allowing more people to uh, move to professional care rather than uh, being uh, held and, uh, and supported in communities. All right, let me set up my next question for Thomas Unger by putting some numbers on the table first. And this speaks to your issue, Dr. Lewis, about pre-pandemic. This is not just over the last couple of years. This goes back well before that. So, Sheldon, let me have, if I can, top of page three. In a pre-pandemic survey, the American Psychological Association found Gen Z were significantly more likely, 27%, than other generations to report just fair or poor mental health. And that includes millennials who come in at 15%, Gen Xers at 13%, Baby boomers, only 7%, and older adults, who you'd think have been through, <laughs> they've been through a lot, 5%. And let's follow up. Only 45% of Gen Z reported very good or excellent mental health compared to, for example, 70% for baby boomers. So, uh, Thomas, let's try this. More youth coming forward saying, I'm concerned about my mental health. I think everybody here tonight agrees. That's a good thing. People should be on top of their mental health situation, in which case... Let's say there is an overdiagnosis of problems. What's the harm? So the, part of the psychological issues that we've been seeing in terms of how people cope with anxiety, again, mental health is not mental illness. So they're, they're using this term of mental health around all their mental distress. Um, and sometimes they're coming forward because they don't know where else to go with that. And the fact that we're interchangeably using the word mental health with mental illness is somewhat of a problem. The other thing we've been talking a little bit about, uh, although we don't want to hang it on it, is that People in their development youth often have to experience what we call manageable empathic failures. You fall down in the park, you scrape your knee. As a child, you, you're, you're sad. Hopefully your parent comforts you enough. They're not absent. They maybe don't make too big a deal of it. And you grow up with those capacities. And then you hit adolescence and a lot of disappointments and things continue. With the safety culture we've had growing up, because all parents, myself, want to protect our kids, do the best for them, we are a little bit concerned that they're so perhaps unprepared for some of the normal emotional upsets that we all go through, the failures, uh, that they're really facing some of them for the first time when they hit adolescence, and hence they don't know where to go with them, and they're coming forward without thinking they're a health condition when there may just be normal emotional distress that needs not professional care, not even to be called a mental health problem, it's just called emotional distress and upset. 
Can you build on that, Jean Twenge? What's the harm in a, in a young person coming forward and thinking they need a diagnosis when, in fact, they don't? Well, I mean, the one possibility is then it is potentially taking resources away um, from those with, with more serious issues who may not have the access to care. So it is potentially an equity issue. Um, but I also want to mention, I agree completely, this is a another possibility for why uh, we have this increase in mental health issues um, and even those that are more objectively measured and not about seeking treatment is it's true that this generation, Gen Z, is growing up more slowly. They are more protected by their parents. They don't have as much experience with independence during adolescence. They're less likely to get a driver's license or drink alcohol or go out with their friends or date um, or have a job. And so they often get to university and don't have much experience making decisions. So this is something else, at least for those young adults, that enters the equation in terms of the rise in, in mental health issues because they just haven't been equipped to enter adulthood in the way that previous generations were. And I think it's also important to acknowledge that this rise in depression and self-harm began in the early 2010s, even though these issues around social co cohesion and societal breakdown have been going on since the 1960s. And although we had increases in depression from the 60s to the 90s, things actually got a little bit better. 90s, 2000s, things stabilized for young people. So there was some sort of catalyst in the early 2010s that seemed to lead to this increase in depression and self-harm. Well, Ralph Lewis, let me set up this next question with another comparison between physical health and mental health. If you get a misdiagnosis, say for a heart attack or a stroke or a burst appendix or something, you're in big trouble. In fact, you know, maybe you're dead. Uh, are the consequences similar if you have a misdiagnosis, as we have been discussing, when it relates to mental health? Uh, well, Steve, for the most part, not as dire as that, but there certainly are consequences. Uh, we have to be uh, very wary of over-medicating uh, patients on the assumption that they have a significant mental disorder. Uh, the evidence uh, shows that medication is usually needed and uh, most often helpful for serious mental disorders. Uh, we don't want to uh, pull that tr uh, trigger uh, too quickly and unnecessarily. Uh, the, the other consequence is uh, the, the problem of swamping, overwhelming the, uh, the mental health system, uh, which prevents people with more serious mental disorders uh, from uh, seeing psychiatrists and getting the help they need. So and that's resources allocation that's right. again. Wait lists go, uh, get longer and longer. Now, you know, part of this is very much uh, our fault as, um, as a professional. As a, as a mental health system, we should have much more uh, stepped care, a, a tiered, stepwise access. Uh, people should not, uh, a psychiatrist should not be the, the first port of call for someone who th thinks that they, uh, they may be experiencing depression or anxiety. Uh, yeah, so the... Um, and, and, and then the other thing is just, um, you know, in, inadvertently reinforcing uh, people's... Uh, sense of being disabled and being incapable of coping in life. It's the opposite of, of promoting resilience. And if I may just add one point about this generation further to Jean's point, this is actually a wonderful generation in many, in many respects, uh, where the generation loosely referred to as Gen, uh, Gen Z or in the US Gen Z and, and late millennials. Uh, you know, uh, there is actually less, or a lot less, of other kinds of, of uh, mental health problems. For example, uh, juvenile delinquency. Now, now, that's not the official term. Conduct disorder is what we call it. Uh, this, remarkably, this has gone down. And a whole lot else uh, has gone down, uh, in, including uh, drunk driving and uh, uh, teenage pregnancy. And I, I could go on and on. And uh, Gene is the expert on, on this. But 
that uh, it's a much nicer generation in many respects. They're also much more sensitive to social justice issues and a whole lot else. But we do need to help them to, to be more resilient and to... Uh, to self-identify as more resilient. Well, in our remaining moments here, one teenage girl who was a patient of yours, uh, who you thought did not meet the criteria for a disorder, had this to say, and, and uh, Quay McKenzie, I'll get you to reflect on this. This patient said, I would like a diagnosis so I know that something is going on and I'm not faking it. So I have a valid reason to feel awful sometimes and not have people get on my case about it. Now, I, you know, anybody with a daughter uh, of this age can relate to that kind of sentiment. Dr. McKenzie, what would you say to that person? Well, I used to do polls of uh, my patients to, uh, to talk about diagnosis. And about 50% of my patients uh, thought diagnosis was useful. About 50% of them thought labels were for cans of food and not for people. But 100% of them wanted effective action to help them with their suffering and their problems. And I don't see that openness to discussion of mental health issues is a problem. I think it's an opportunity. I think the issue is what we do about it. We have a gift of people coming forwards and saying they need help. And the question for me is how we use that to build mental health literacy so that we can deal with this, I need a diagnosis in order to legitimize my being how we build individual and community resilience and how we create more supportive workplaces, schools and societies. I was reading the new National Institutes of Clinical Excellence guidelines on the treatment of depression and anxiety, which comes out of the UK. And they are set to announce that the first line, evidence-based, cost-effective treatment of mild depression and anxiety uh, will be a structured exercise program or group CBT. So they're going towards offering exercise or building skills for psychological resilience as the way of dealing with this issue. And it may be that rather than saying, hey, what's going on with these kids? Our question should be, how have we not pivoted to be able to give people what they want. I mean, Gen Z's is one third of the population. So maybe we have to think about, just as uh, Dr. Lewis said, how we set up our system so that uh, they are given the right skills and supports uh, close to home in community rather than medicalizing their distress. Hmm. Thomas Unger, in our last minute here, maybe you could weigh in on that as well. It's almost as if this young, uh, this young patient of Dr. Lewis's was looking for a diagnosis to, in some respects, explain and or accept just the condition of being human. What do you say to that person? Yeah, so this is where the skill, the judgment, the tact of a good clinician comes in to help differentiate what is just normal suffering and not give a diagnosis where it's not warranted as opposed to diagnose those who really do have uh, what we consider a mental illness. Because when we can explain a diagnosis to someone who warrants it, it often is very welcome. It gets them off the hook. They no longer personalize and have all those self-stigmatizing thoughts of I'm weak, it's my fault, what does it say about me? Instead, it's just a health condition that's happening to them that we can treat and it's not about them as a person. So that judgment intact to make sure that we don't overdiagnose, that we help tell them it's normal, Humans are strong, they can adapt, we can grow, and we will triumph is a hopeful message, to, but still support them through those, those moments of emotional distress. Great. Thanks so much, you four. That was a great discussion tonight. Out of town, Gene Twangy in San Diego, California, Thomas Unger in Vancouver, British Columbia, Quam McKenzie in Geneva, Switzerland, and here in our studio, Ralph Lewis. Great to have you all on TVO tonight. Many thanks. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Steve. For some of us, it's impossible to read the word regret without humming a little Frank Sinatra. And in some ways, the lyrics to his classic My Way might do quite well, introducing Daniel Pink's new book. It's called The Power of Regret, How Looking Backward Moves Us Forward. And he joins us now from Washington, D.C. for more. Daniel, it's great to meet you. How are you doing tonight? 
I'm very good. Thanks for having me, Steve. Not at all. Uh, let's just talk a bit about the inspiration for the book, because I gather we have to go back a few years to your daughter's college graduation. Huh. What happened there? Well, I had a, a kid graduate from, from college in 2019, and I'm sitting at her graduation, and I'm having a kind of out-of-body experience, because I can't believe this kid is old enough to graduate from college. I can't believe that I'm old enough to have a kid who's graduated from college. And I, and I started thinking about my own regrets about being in university. Uh, I wish I had been bolder. I wish I had been kinder. I, I wish I had taken more risks. And uh, when I came back to talk to people about that, very sheepishly, I found that they leaned in in a way that just staggered me and that people wanted to talk about this topic, which I previously had thought was taboo. And that brought me on a multi-year journey to try to understand this profoundly misunderstood emotion. Let's uh, do an excerpt from the book here as we dive in deeper. You write, some beliefs operate quietly, like existential background music. Others become anthems for a way of living. And few credos blare more loudly than the doctrine that regret is foolish, that it wastes our time and sabotages our well-being. From every corner of the culture, the message booms. Forget the past. Seize the future. Bypass the bitter. Savor the sweet. A good life has a singular focus forward, and an unwavering valence, positive. Regret perturbs both. It is backward-looking and unpleasant, a toxin in the bloodstream of happiness. Okay, what have we got so wrong? First of all, that's beautifully written, I gotta say. Well done. Hey, thanks. What have we got so wrong about regret, in your view? <laughs> well, we've gotten, we've gotten two things wrong. Uh, number, number one, a good life is not uniformly positive, and a good life is not uniformly Forward, forward looking. What we know from 60 years of research in social psychology and cognitive science and developmental psychology and social psychology is that everybody has regrets. Regret is one of the most common emotions that human beings have. It is arguably the most common negative emotion that human beings have. It is ubiquitous in the human experience. This credo that you just mentioned of no regrets, truly, Steve, there are a few people who don't have regrets. And I'll tell you who they are. Five-year-olds don't have regrets <laughs> because their brains haven't <laughs> developed enough. People with certain kinds of neurodegenerative disorders like Huntington's disease or certain kinds of brain damage don't have regret. And sociopaths don't have regret. Everybody else has regret. And so what's weird is that this emotion, which I don't like, here's the thing, I don't like experiencing regret. It's negative, it's, it's unpleasant, but it's ubiquitous. And you have to ask yourself, why is that the case? And the reason is, is because if we treat it right, regret is useful. Indeed, it's arguably our most transformative emotion. It can help us on an array of things if we treat it right. I'll pursue more on that in a second, but I, I guess I need to follow up by asking, when you talk to the myriad people that you do who say, oh, I've lived a life without regrets, do you simply not believe them? Well, I mean, I probe a little bit. So, you know, I, collect, I collected regrets from people all over the world, as, as you know. And, you know, sometimes I had people who would tell to me, say to me, I say, what's your, what's your big regret? Oh, I don't have any regrets. I, had, I, I have no regrets at all. Now, um, when I was a kid, I bullied another kid and I felt bad about it for 40 years, but I don't have any regrets. <laughs> um, that, that, is, that is, there's such a stigma to the very word that people seem allergic to it. People want to avoid it, but it is truly ubiquitous in the, in the human experience. There are a few people for whom they, they feel like they don't have regrets because they've adequately processed them, but that's a very small number of people. When you probe just a little bit, you discover that every human being has regrets. You referenced a second ago this world regret survey that you put together, and I just wonder what, what was it like for you to look through a litany of, you know, regret after regret after regret after regret? What was that like? <laughs> it was weirdly fascinating and uplifting. Uh, so what I did is I established a website called the World Regret Survey. And to date, I just checked this morning, I just checked uh, today, the, the, we have now over 21,000 regrets from people in 109 countries. 21, over 21,000 regrets from people in 109 countries, where people are describing their, their biggest regrets. And, and, and I read through, for the research in this book, I read through the first 15,000 of them. And it's fascinating because, you know, at some level, when people are telling you what they regret the most, they're telling you what they value the most. So it was just a really kind of 
in a weird way, this beautiful chorus of longing, this beautiful chorus of human aspiration. And so um, I, I would thought that it would bring me down, but it actually lifted me up. Hmm. Now, I, I guess we know the most cliched regret that you never hear is somebody on their deathbed saying, I regret I didn't spend more time at the office. Okay, we all know that. But looking through those 21,000, or the vast majority of them, as you just indicated, what was the most, like, which is the one that just sort of reached out and slapped you in the face and said, oh, wow, that is a seriously fascinating regret? Well, I, I mean, th there, there were a few. I think that one of them was how often we had regrets of boldness. And I think what's interesting about these regrets and the way that regret researchers had previously categorized regrets was by looking at them by the domain of life. So this is an education regret or a career regret or a romance regret. And what I found is that one of the biggest categories was regrets where people were at a juncture in their life, they could play it safe or take the chance. And when they didn't take the chance, not all the time, but man, oh man, most of the time they regretted it. And it could be, I, I didn't study abroad in, in university. Uh, I have lots of regret. I mean, hundreds of people who say there was somebody I liked romantically years ago. I wanted to ask him or her out on a date, but I was too chicken to, and I didn't. Lots of regrets about not starting businesses. Um, really, what, one of the, I think one of the most prominent things that you see is that regrets of inaction, regrets of not doing things, are far more prevalent, but also far more painful than regrets of action. That to me was one of the biggest findings uh, in this survey. You've categorized them into four sort of broad buckets and let's, uh, let's go through those right now if you would. Sure. Foundational regrets is number one. Tell us what that means. Those are regrets about small choices that you make early in life that accumulate to negative consequences later in life. So what you often see on these are people who didn't take their health seriously, didn't exercise, didn't eat right. And then over time, it's a very hard problem to undo. A lot of regrets about uh, in fun the financial realm, about people who spent too much and saved too little. Again, it's not immediately devastating, but over time it is devastating. Uh, more regrets than I expected about people who didn't work hard enough in school and didn't work hard enough in university and now are dealing with the consequences. So foundation regrets are, if only I'd done the work. Number two, boldness regrets refers to what? Right. Yeah, we, we talked about those a moment ago. These are regrets about people who didn't travel, didn't start a business, didn't speak up, didn't stand up for something that they believed in, didn't pursue a romantic interest. It, it's really a, a case of, of having a moment in your life where you could take this chance or not. And when people didn't take the chance, overwhelmingly, they regretted it. So uh, boldness regrets are, if only I'd taken the chance. Number three, moral regrets, an example of which would be what? Uh, marital infidelity, lots of those. A lot of regrets about, about bullying. A uh, lot of regrets about other kinds of um, sort of lower grade cheating and stealing. So people who shoplifted and still feel bad about it, people who might have swindled a business partner. Um, more regrets, again, you're at a juncture, you can do the right thing, you can do the wrong thing. When people do the wrong thing, I mean, Steve, most of us regret it. Um, so more regrets are if only I'd done the right thing. Number four, connection regrets, which are what? Connection regrets are about relationships, and not just about romantic relationships, but about the full sweep of relationships in our lives. And what typically happens here is that you have a relationship um, with a, um, a sibling, with a parent, with a kid, with a friend um, that was intact or should have been intact, and it comes apart. And it usually comes apart in undramatic ways, a slow kind of drift. One person wants to reach out, they don't because they think it's going to feel awkward. They think the other side's not going to care. So the drift widens, um, and then people, and then sometimes it's too late. So connection regrets are if only I'd reached out. And what's interesting about these regrets from these 21,000 regrets all over the world is how universal they are. If I were to show you this database and just show you the field with the regret and block out the identifying information about gender or age or where they're from, I think that you would have a hard time distinguishing a 38-year-old woman from Toronto to from a 30 to, from a 58 year old uh, man in Kuala Lumpur from a 17 year old in Sheboygan Wisconsin hmm.
Fascinating. The, the one line, and I know you've heard it a thousand times as well, is that what's the point of having regrets? It's in the past. The past is past. We can't do anything about it. So what's the constructive use behind it anyway? How'd you like to take a kick at that? Sure. I mean, I think that it's, it's, it's an important question because it's the way that we deal with regret is important. So we, have to, we, have to, we, we typically think of it in this very binary way. We can ignore our regrets, okay? That's, as you're saying, that's in the past. Can't change the past. Don't worry about it. Look forward. That's not a particularly good idea. That's a recipe for delusion. The other, uh, the other danger is that we wallow in our regrets. We spend our time living in the past. We ruminate on those regrets. That's a bad idea, too. That's a recipe for despair. What we want to do is look our regrets in the eye, look at our regrets as signal, as information, as data, and do something about them. Confront them systematically, forgive our, you know, confront them systematically, draw lessons from them, and use those lessons going forward. And we have, in social science, so much evidence that doing that helps us become better negotiators, helps us become better strategists, helps us become better problem solvers, clearer thinkers, and, um, and finding greater meaning in life. That is, if we confront our regrets, don't ignore them and don't wallow in them, there are an array of benefits because regret is part of our cognitive machinery. It's there for a reason, and we can enlist it as an engine for progress. What's the biggest reason people give you for their either unwillingness or failure to confront their regrets and therefore learn from them? I, I think it's twofold. It's a great question. Uh, I think part of it is discomfort uh, because um, regret doesn't feel good. And so our instinct sometimes is to avoid that discomfort, just to bypass it. What we need to do is use that discomfort as a signal. I think that's one part of it. The other part is that truly, I don't think that, especially in North America, we have done a very good job of helping people deal with negative emotions. We don't, we don't instruct people that negative emotions are part of life, and there's a systematic way to confront them and use them. So what happens is, is that we either blithely say, oh, no regrets, I'm all positive all the time or we end up getting debilitated by them. Uh, and so I would, you know, what, what I think more broadly is that North American society needs to have a kind of reckoning with negative emotions and needs to help people of all ages say negative emotions are part of life. They don't need to bring you down if we respond to them in a coherent, smart, systematic way. Hmm. What kind of qualities do we need to have as people in order to be open to the notion of We've got regrets. We're going to look into the past at them and learn from them. I, you know, I think that, that, that it's not only a question of personal qualities. I think that it's, a, it's really a matter of teaching people how to do this. And, and the first step, which is a, sort of a, a personal quality, is, and, and it could be one of the most important things, is that when we make mistakes, when we screw up, when we blunder, the way that we talk to ourselves is brutal. I mean, I, I, listen, I, I do that. If, if you were somehow to broadcast my self-talk out into the world, you would think I was a lunatic the way I talk to myself, okay? So, so, the, so the, the remedy here is pretty simple. Don't do that. There's a whole line of research in what's called self-compassion. And what it tells us is this, that we should, in the face of mistakes, in the face of regret, treat ourselves with kindness rather than contempt. Don't treat ourselves better than anybody else, but certainly don't treat ourselves worse than anybody else. Recognize, treat ourselves with kindness, recognize that mistakes and regrets are part of the human condition, uh, and also recognize that any regret, any mistake that we make is a moment in our life, not the full measure of our life. And that first step, that tool right there of self-compassion is a way to relieve a lot of the burden of regret um, and allow people to begin making sense of our, their regrets and drawing lessons from them. Daniel, you've got an anecdote in the book in which you refer to somebody who's got no regrets tattooed on their body, misspelled, but tattooed on their body. Um, maybe you could just go into some of the detail around that story and why somebody felt the... What would be the use of putting that on your body forever? Well, I mean, I think it's a, it's a sign of... It's either a sign of commitment or weak commitment. I'm not sure why. Mm -hmm. Um, that is, you know, when we think about how we um, display our beliefs, uh, you know, our, you know, our political beliefs, we might wear a, a button on our lapel, we might put a sign in our yard. Uh, but having this phrase, no regrets, enshrined on our body is a, is a pretty 
good commitment. Um, and, and I always wondered whether it was because people truly believed it or because they didn't quite believe it and wanted that constant re reaffirmation. <laughs> I think that one of the, the interesting things is a fellow I wrote about named Jeff Bosley, who got this no regrets tattoo on his arm. He was he's an American. He served in the U.S. military. Before, as he went into the military, he got a no regrets tattoo on his left arm, the arm that he would look at as he shot his rifle. And then 14 years later, he had the tattoo removed. So he had a no regrets tattoo that he ended up regretting and having it removed. It was just one, <laughs> which is, you know, <laughs> one reason he tattoo removal business in the U.S. is a hundred million dollar a year business. <laughs> I know you pointed that out, a hundred million bucks a year. So it does show that we do have regrets because uh, anybody who wants to spend that much money to take those tattoos off clearly has some regrets and is prepared to come to terms with them. Okay, I get Absolutely. it. Absolutely. You know, I haven't asked you this yet. I've been sort of saving it for closer to the end. And I, I met, uh, of course, you get asked it all the time, but uh, I still want to know anyway. Your own personal regrets. What's at the top of your list? I have I have a lot because I'm a human being. Um, I think that the the one that bugs me the most, Steve, are are regrets of kindness, and it's a little bit peculiar in that um, when I was younger, I was never a bully, um, but there were many times in my life, um, especially when I was a young when I was in university, when I was a younger man, um, where people were being mistreated. And I was there. I was seeing it. They, they, were, they were being excluded. They weren't being treated fairly. I saw it going on. It's not like I didn't see it. And it's not like I didn't know it was wrong. I knew it was wrong. And I didn't do anything. And that has bothered me, I mean, for decades. And so it's a good example in some ways of like, what do you do with that? So I could say, I'm, oh, I'm I'm feeling terrible about this inaction, this, this not standing up for people and not including people. Um, ah, it's in the past, doesn't matter. Or I could say that that's a bad idea. Or I could say, oh my God, I'm the worst person in the world. I'm just a horrible, wretched human being. That's a bad idea too. What we need to do, and it's, I think there's a lesson in this, is that that regret is a signal. I've made all kinds of decisions today that I don't even remember. But something that I did, or in this case didn't do, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, that's still sitting with me, that's telling me something. That's telling me what I value. It turns out it's a message that, hey, you value kindness more than you might realize. And it instructs me on how to do better in the future. And so what I've tried to do is when I find myself in those situations now is use that unpleasant feeling. And, and, and if I see people being excluded, or if I see people not being treated fairly, is to stand up and say something or reach out and bring people in. And so, again, if we treat our regrets properly, they can clarify what we value and teach us how to do better in the future. I, I'm genuinely not trying to put you on the spot with this follow-up question, but I wonder whether you ever go so far as to either send an email or pick up the phone to the people of 20 and 30 years ago that you saw in those circumstances and say, you know, something's been bugging me all these years. You know what? I haven't done that. I haven't done that, Steve. Uh, and, and I've thought about it, and maybe I, I lack the guts to do that. However, I have talked to a lot of people, especially who were bullies, okay? So mine is a little bit more kind of, it's, it, in some ways it's even worse. It's sort of passive unkindness. Um, but I, I've, talk, I've talked to many people who bullied other people when they were younger who have gone back and done that. And I think what's interesting about those conversations, at least as they've been reported to me, is that the people on the receiving end of it are far less troubled by the person on the perpetrator end. Uh, hmm. that the people who are on the receiving end often have made sense of it, often have gotten past it. But it's really stuck with the, the, um, the people who did the bullying because they did something wrong. They did something wrong. It's their fault. They have agency there, and they made a moral blunder, and, and they're living with it. The people who are simply on the receiving end have often shrugged it off as human beings who are typically resilient often shrug off these kinds of things. That's quite a comforting thing to know. Well, okay, in our last minute and change here, um, how do I want to ask this question? Okay, uh, plain and simple, what's your favorite song as it relates to regrets? Because you do mention one in the book uh, that is particular at the top of your list, which I don't think is going to be the same as what's on the top of my list, but let's compare and contrast. Go ahead. Well, I mean, I have to say, I love the Edith Piaf song, uh, Je ne regrette rien, I regret nothing, in part because her life was the exact embodiment of the opposite. This is somebody <laughs> who died penniless um, with a pile of regrets, who on her deathbed uh, was expressing regrets. In but her it's 40s. A, it's a, 
in her 40s. Yeah. It, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful song uh, by someone who led a wretched, regret-filled life. <laughs> yeah, see, I mean, regrets What's I've yours? had. A, well, uh, obviously, I, I hinted at it in the intro. Regrets I've had a oh, few, Sinatra. but then again, too few to mention. I did what I had to do. I saw it through without exemption. Anyway, how can you not love that song, particularly since it's written by a Canadian, right? Paul Anka. <laughs> of course. Now, here's one thing, Daniel, we can both agree on. What's your favorite hockey team? Oh, the, uh, the, the, the Leafs, no question. Go Leafs, go. Okay, that's very weird because you're in Washington, D.C., but we yes. love the fact that you're a Leaf fan. Is it appropriate to put on the list of lifelong regrets the fact that the Maple Leafs have the longest futility streak of Stanley Cup champions now going on 55 years? Well, you know what? It's actually, this is an important kind of uh, sociological and metaphysical distinction that you're making here, Steve, because regret requires agency. Okay. So, so regret, so, so it's not my fault that the Leafs haven't, haven't won. So what I'm experiencing is disappointment, not regret. Um, so the people who should have regret are, well, the people who own the team and, <laughs> and run the team, not those of us who go to Washington Capitals games wearing Toronto Maple Leafs jerseys and have Washingtonians say, what? Which I find, I, I, I'm deeply impressed with that. I think you need to keep doing that. And, and I'm going to disagree with you a little bit. As a fan who screams and loses his voice at almost every game I attend, you know, I feel I do have agency, and it feels like if only I'd shared louder, maybe, maybe, maybe they do it this time. But um, I guess Wait not. Wait till next season. Wait till next season. How many years have we been saying that? Anyways. Uh, 56? Five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good yeah. for Colorado. Good for Colorado. Daniel Pink, uh, it's been so great having you on the program. The name of the book is The Power of Regret, How Looking Backward Moves Us Forward. You make the case, and we're glad you made it on TVO tonight. Many thanks. Thanks for having me, Steve. And that is the agenda for Wednesday, June 29th, 2022. Tomorrow, historian Neil Ferguson is with us on his new book, tracking how natural and human-made disasters have both threatened and advanced our species. And just before we go, a reminder to stay tuned on air or on our website and social feeds for the latest episode of The Threat with Nan Kiwanuka. She's exploring what two years of pandemic has meant for people's mental health and what to do about it. I'm Steve Pagan. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pagan is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.